أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد respected elders my younger brothers Sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. The holy month of Ramadan is a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to transform ourselves into better human beings. Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. Oh, Allah alayhi salam. In the dua whereby he welcomes the holy month of Ramadan, which is recorded in the Sahifa Sajjadiyya, he says that this holy month is Shahru Ramadan, is Shahru Siyam, and Shahru Islam, and Shahru Tahur, and Shahru Tamhis, and Shahru Qiyam. It is the month of fasting, it is the month of experiencing Islam and obedience and submission to God. It is the month of purging oneself of the evil poison and the toxins that have entered our not only our body but also our minds and hearts. And it is the month of after having purged and removed the dirt it's the month of purifying and cleansing and developing ourselves. And it is the Shahr al Qiyam, the month of being able to rise up to carry out with our full energy the duties that we have and obligations that we have towards our Lord. Again, in order to appreciate the significance of those, this holy month, allow me to remind ourselves about this famous khutbah, which the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi recited towards the end of Sha'ban, before the beginning of Ramadan, Ayyuhan Nas, O people, قَدْ أَقْبَلَ إِلَيْكُمْ شَهْرُ اللَّهِ this is a month which has come to us as a visitor, as a guest, as a special gift and opportunity from God. How many months of Ramadan can we really expect in our lifetime? You become valid at the age of 10, having completed 9 full years for a young lady. Or at the age of 16 having completed 15 lunar years for the young man. And let's say your average life expectancy 50, 60, 80. So how many Ramadan honestly can you expect in your lifetime? An opportunity to be able to transform yourself. This visitor has come. This visitor has come with a lot of gifts. He has brought to us from God special blessings the opportunity to ask and to get accepted our forgiveness and pardon and the opportunity to receive special barakah and special grace and mercy how so this gift is so enriching, so profound, so powerful that it is the best of the months, the best of the days of the year, the best of the nights. No, every moment in this month is the best of the moments. How so? How come? A particular time period, a night or a day, or a moment in the night or day, can become so meritorious and excellent as to surpass all the other time periods of the rest of the year. 
That's because هو شهر دعيت فيه إلى طيافة الله. You've been invited to become special guests. God is offering you special hospitality. Enjoy from the spiritual banquet that God is offering. The different blessings that are on display. جعلت فيه من أهل كرامة الله. He wants to grant you a special honor. أنفاسكم فيه تسبيح. You become holy in this month in that your breathing, breathing is uh, some which is an involuntary act. We don't control our breathing. Um, if we were required to control our breathing, we would sleep. <laughs> the moment you become unconscious, you die. But no, even when we're unconscious and sleep, breathing automatically continues. But this involuntary act has now been become rewardable. In this month, the unconscious involuntary breathing is rewarded. And fasukum fihi tasbih. You have the reward of tasbih and the dhikr of God. Wanaumukum fihi ibadah. Your whole sleep period is an act of worship. وَعَمَلُكُمْ فِيهِ مَقْبُولٌ And in this month, your actions will be easily acceptable and therefore rewardable and therefore will change you and improve you. وَدُعَاؤُكُمْ فِيهِ مُسْتَجَابٌ And your du'as in this month are answered. So pray, pray for whatever is good for you. Question, what is it about this month that honors us to receive all these blessings, whereby even our unconscious acts become rewardable. My dua answer, I pray to my Lord with sincerity, with earnestness, with my full devotion to Him. Okay, these conditions are required for the validity of a dua to be accepted. My actions will be rewarded. I am performing those actions in this month with sincerity, with devotion, with concentration, so my actions are acceptable. But how come? How come? In this month, even the involuntary acts become rewardable. Why See you. I don't know. There could be a possible explanation. So just listen to me. You know, on a daily basis, we're told that if you perform certain acts uh, and then you go to sleep, then your sleep becomes an act of ibadah. So, for example, before you go to sleep, you perform wudu. And when you sleep, you rest towards the qibla. And then you engage in the dhikr and the recitation of certain surahs of the Qur'an. And then gradually you doze off to sleep. And therefore your whole sleep becomes a barrier. Sleep is an essential requirement for the physical body to refresh and to rejuvenate. But the mind, the soul is alive. The soul doesn't go to sleep. In fact, the soul becomes the guest of God during sleep. And that's why we see dreams. And of course, the problem with us is we don't recall our dreams because we are distracted during sleep by the preoccupations of the activities of the daytime. So if my niya is there to be good, to do good, so long as my consciousness allows me, so long as my body allows me, that's good enough in God's eyes to qualify me to get the reward for that ibadah. So in this holy month, because we have made the near, that in obedience to God, I will avoid that which is halal, food, drinks, halal, to have relationship with your living spouse, halal otherwise. Consciously, voluntarily, in submission to God's will, I have decided to avoid that which is halal. Obviously, therefore, I'm even more eager and more ready and more motivated to avoid that which displeases God. God loves this so much 
He says, no, you are a holy person now. You are blessed. You are oriented towards higher spirituality. No, you are like the angels. Angels don't eat. Angels don't drink. Angels engage in Zikr. Angels are always obedient to God. Temporarily, you have decided to become like an angel. I will reward you for that. And therefore, one of the great achievements in this month is to be able to use and exploit this opportunity to change ourselves. The hadith says that in this month, فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ وَالْجِنَانِ The doors of the heavens are open. غُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النِّيرَانِ The doors of hell are closed. غُلَّتْ مَرَدَةُ الشَّيَاطِينِ The devils and the demons, they are all chained, they are blocked. So the opportunity is available for us to become good should we will to do so. And therefore, the uh, Imams of the Ahlul Bayt have taught us that Ramadan should become the beginning of a new year. And you should have a resolution for this new year. There's an interesting dua which is recommended to be recited at the beginning of the holy month of Ramadan. And all our great shaykhs and scholars have reported it. Shaykh Kulaymi in Al Kafi, Shaykh. Saduq in his Al Faqih and uh, Sheikh Tusi in his Tahzib. It's a powerful dua. Take it as a dua for the new year, new spiritual year resolution. So the dua begins by saying, Allahumma inni as'aluka bismika alladhi dana lahu kullu shay wa bi rahmatika alladhi wasi'at kullu shay some of the same names that we invoke in the dua of Qumayna. I'm skipping the details. I'm just quoting one or two phrases from this long dua. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, salli ala Muhammadin wa ahli bayti wa al-ismi fi mustaqbali sanati hadihi sitrak. Oh Allah, clothe me in this future year, coming year, beginning for the month of Ramadan, clothe me in your special protective gear. Enlighten me, brighten my face spiritually. Give me a new spiritual life whereby I begin to love you and you alone and not other things lower than you. And enable me to reach your ultimate pleasure. Oh Lord, I want the best. I don't know the details, but I want the best. There are others who are close to you, who are beloved to you, who are in love with you. They are, they are praying for something, they are asking for something, they are striving for something, and you are granting them. Oh Lord, grant me some of those blessings that you are giving them. And then the dua continues, I skip certain uh, details, and I quote yet another phrase. Allahumma wa a'udhu bika min an tuhiyta bi khati'ati wa zulmi wa israfi ala nafsi. Allah, I wish and I pray to you to protect me in this coming year to be overwhelmed with sins and with wrongdoing and with excessive actions against my nafs, against the, the advantage or the benefit of what is useful for my nafs. And I follow, that I should follow in this month my desires, I see protection. And to follow my sinful animal passions and desires against your will. Because this will now become a barrier between me and your special grace and mercy from reaching me. And therefore, allow me to say 
in this new year, new spiritual year resolution, one of the fundamental requests, prayers that we make is, O oh Lord, enable me to guard myself, to protect myself from sins. So allow me to elaborate on this particular aspect of our spiritual development. If you look at the uh, teachings of the Ahlul Bayt and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi they remind us that sins are dangerous, sins are damaging, sins can uh, can deaden your heart, sins can destroy your soul, beware of sins. So, um, one hadith says that sins are a sickness, spiritual sickness. Sins are a sickness, the cure and the healing for the sickness is istighfar. Another Hadith, which is corroborated by what the Quran also says, is that sins are not only a sickness, but sins make us follow the shaitan. And if we do that repetitively, we become his servants. We become we become slaves to the devil. That's the second dangerous effect of sins in our lives. In fact, people who know what is right and who know what's wrong, yet they can't stop themselves. And they are slaves to another master. The master commands them. And they say, yes, sir. Um, in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, Allah says on the day of judgment, when the final decision will be made, who is to go to hell and who is to go to heaven, the sinners will say, oh Lord, don't prosecute and don't punish us for the sins. We didn't do it. Him. He's the one who made us do it, the devil. The Quran says on the day of judgment the devil would become a lawyer, but he won't have a lawyer to defend him. He'll defend himself. The Shaiman will say, Son of Adam, Ma kanani alaykum in Sultan. I never had any authority over you. <laughs> don't accuse me, don't blame me. I am the one who made you sin. Because God never gave me the power to force you, to compel you, to overwhelmingly order you in such a way that you could never say no. I never had that power. God never gave me that power over you. Illa and Oh yes, God gave me the power to to invite, to suggest, to entice, to tempt, to to plant some ideas in your mind, to, to make some things attractive for you, to make you forget the, the, the evil of the sin, to, to make the sin look lighter in your eyes. Oh yes, I had that power. But you had the power to judge, to decide, to assess, to reflect. And to finally decide yes or no. Illa and the You answered me. You said yes, sir. Yes, master. So don't blame me. Blame yourself. So sins have a damaging effect in that they make us sick. They make us slaves to the shaitan. Sins also make a third effect mentioned in the Quran in the Riwayat is that. Sins are a burden on us. In Surah Al Kabut, Allah says, Afqal, they're carrying a heavy burden. Try to, try to run if you can with heavy baggage. Try to climb the mountain with heavy luggage. Forget about running and climbing. Walk with heavy stuff on your backs. And you will be held back. Sins tend to slow us down in our spiritual progress. They tend to gravitate us down to the lowly, earthly, animal life. A fourth effect in the riwayat and also mentioned in the Quran is that sins ultimately deaden the heart 
and harden the heart, and in fact, seal the heart. Therefore, it becomes unresponsive now to anything which is good. Even if they see the truth, even if they hear the truth, they simply don't respond. The heart is dead now. The sins have affected and overwhelmed. If that is a problem, for the rest of the year we have undergone, unfortunately, these sinful experiences and activities. Now is the time to be able to purge ourselves and remove those effects. Incidentally, this dua that I was quoting in the beginning of the month of Ramadan, the spiritual year, New Year resolution, in that dua, just like in dua Qumayr, so also in this dua, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, salli ala Muhammad wa Ali, wa gfir li al-zhuroob al-lati tughayyir al-ni'am. Allah, forgive me those sins which remove the blessings that you give me. For example, once I don't do any shukr and I'm not appreciative of the gifts that you give me, you take away those gifts from me. Allah, wa gfir li al-zhuroob al-lati tunzir al-niqam. واغفر لي الظروب التي تقطع الرجاء واغفر لي الظروب التي تهيل الأعداء uh, empowers the enemy over me because I've become weak through my sinfulness الظروب التي ترد الدعاء there are some sins that block my duas from being accepted يستحق بها نزول البلاء تحبس غيث السماء it blocks the rain. It shames me in public. Forgive me those sins. Which shorten my life. Which bring me a sense of shame and, and regret. And ultimately, Allah, there are those sins which tear away this veil of dignity and respect and decency that you granted me when I came to this world. Everybody comes to this world innocent with a God-given dignity as a human being. But when we sin, we tear, we begin to damage this veil and this protection of dignity that God has given us. In the hadith, the, the, these sins have been explained. Those who imbibe intoxicants, those who drink, for example, those who engage in gambling, those who indulge in plays which cause mockery and ridicule, those who gossip about others, others' vices, those who associate themselves with the disbelievers in their disbelief, associate with a disbeliever in a respectful relationship no longer. To associate with the agnostics, with the skeptics, with the deniers in such a way that we get influenced by them. No, you're beginning to tear this veil of decency and the isma and the isam that Allah has granted us. Therefore, in this new year, spiritual new year, Resolution, one of the most important tasks that we have to achieve in this holy month is to be able to purge ourselves, is to be able to ask for forgiveness, is to be able to learn how to control ourselves. I would like to share with you one hadith. And uh, it, it is a hadith about the powerful weapons Allah has given us to fight against the devil. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The hadith was reported from the sixth Imam who reports it from all his fathers till the Holy Prophet that the companions were told, Ala ukhbirukum bi shayin in antum fa'altumuhu can I teach you something? If you act and use this weapon, shaitan will run away from you. Just like the east is far away from the west, shaitan will avoid you. Everybody has got a problem with shaitan. 
So all the companions said, yes, give us those weapons. And the Prophet says, As-Sawm, fasting, As-Sawm, you sell we do what you have. Fasting will darken or blacken his face. He will become ashamed, for example. He will be unhappy with your decisions to fast and to control yourself and to voluntarily decide to obey God and to avoid even the halal so that your ability to avoid the haram is strengthened. Oh, Shaitan dislikes that. He's unhappy. His face is darkened. Uh, no, uh, allow me to interpret this a little more physically. You know, you want to fight with your enemy. Punch! Oh, so now you've given him, him a black eye. Punch! A second black eye. Punch! A bleeding nose. Punch! And a bleeding lip. The face is being attacked. Past him. No! But, but, but he's still standing. He, he's ready to fight back. So the next step the Prophet suggests, do the second act, and you give him one deadly blow on his back, and he falls to the ground. His back is broken if you give sadaqah. Be unselfish. Ya Rasulullah, but not all of us can give sadaqah. No, when you're breaking your fast, you have one piece of date, give him half a piece of date. Sadaqah. Everyone can give some sadaqah that Allah has granted him extra of. Break his back, become selfless. Number three. Ah, so he's bleeding and he's on the ground, but he's alive. He can, he can stand up again. He can continue his fight. The third weapon. وَالْحُبُّ فِي اللَّهِ وَالْمُؤَازَرَةُ عَلَى الْعَمَلِ الصَّالِحِ لِيَقْطَعْ دَابِرَةِ You can literally uproot him. If you love your brother for the sake of God, well, not because he, uh, he is from the same economic class and uh, he's a relative or he's your special friend or, you know, he's from the same tribe or the same background. No, hubfillah. He's a creature of God. He's a creation of God. He's the same in my faith. That's why I respect him, even if his color or language or culture is different from mine. Selfless behavior. Respectful behavior to other creatures. Shaitan loves to create disunity. Shaitan loves to break relations between parents and children, between spouses, between friends, between community members, between different communities. No, have godly, divinely inspired, respectful love and appreciation and affirmation towards other human beings. And that kills the shaitan. And finally, so he's beaten up on, and he is broken his back and he's on the ground. And now you're beginning to uproot him. But he's still got the last breaths. So the final weapon the Holy Prophet suggests, wal istighfar yaqta' watin. You want to slaughter him? Istighfar. The first thing Shaitan refused to do. Istighfar. Oh, I am better. I can do what I want. I think I am better than him. You have asked me to bow down. I don't accept it. The root cause of sinfulness. I know God has said so and so, and I know He's telling me not to do this, but I think otherwise. Well, that's a devilish way of thinking. I think I know better than God. No, I still bar means I'm sorry. I know you are the master. I know you legislate that which is good for me. I have done something wrong. I admit I've done something wrong. I feel sorry about it. And I'm asking for forgiveness. I will not repeat this again.
Shaitan hates this. This is very much anti-devilish istighfar. It kills him temporarily. But Shaitan is all alone. He's got a whole army out there. So this struggle has to be ongoing. I'd like to end with one beautiful quote that I came across. Um, there was this American woman. She was blind. Keller. Helen Keller. Um, she says that I have for many years tried to make this truth very clear to everyone. But people still marvel when I tell them that I am blind but I'm happy. I want to show you the power, the willpower that can develop in an individual and changes everything in their lives. And fasting is one powerful method to develop this willpower. People imagine, she says, my limitations weigh down upon my spirit. They chain me to, to, to a rock, to a rock of despair. Yet, she says, it seems to me happiness has little to do with the senses. It has to do with the mind. If the mind decides something, the body will obey. That's the spirit of fasting. How to train the mind in such a way that when it decides to do something, the body says, yes, master, to the soul, not to the devil. Nothing can stop you back. Nothing can hold you back. Your will is always in your control. Yes, sickness may challenge your body, but, but, but are you your body? No, you're more than your body. You're a body and a spirit. It's the spirit that rules the body. And nowadays it's very clear in the medical profession, healing after medical intervention depends on the mental attitude of the individual. Some people heal faster, some people heal slower. It's going to do right with their spirit. Lameness, she says, may paralyze the legs. But you're not your legs only. You're something more than your legs. So you, you need not be affected by external challenges if your inner soul and spirit is powerful, and one of the most powerful weapons we have to empower ourselves and to strengthen ourselves is fasting. Let's pray to Allah for Tawfiq that in this holy month, this visitor who has come full of blessings, we open the doors of our heart to welcome this visitor so that this visitor can refurnish our home, our hearts, remove the dirt, clean it up and furnish it with powerful, positive, progressive, spiritually developing traits, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.